Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm very happy to welcome you all to this 2022 Undergraduate Research Day. But most importantly, I'm very, I welcome you back to our in-person, on Zoom, expanded option approach to engagement. As you all know, last year we had a fantastic online experience and I think we have learned a lot of how we can bridge the two together and be able to still be able to be engaged whether we are in person here or even if we are on online. So this is a long tradition we have had now. It's what uh, Dr. Godavarti, our 11th year, oh. 12th, 12th year, 12th year of the undergraduate research. I'm, I'm losing count. Yeah. Those of you who don't know me because Many of you may not know me since you are starting a uh, freshman. I'm Ranu Jung. I'm the chair of the department of this fantastic family of ours. And uh, the lifeblood of all of us faculty, grad students, is you undergrads. You give us strength. You give us the, um, you, you keep us young. You know, maybe we, we, maybe we forget how old we are because we are hanging out with you guys. So welcome. It is a day, packed day today. We have got uh, posters that our students are going to be able to present. We know it has been very challenging for many of you undergrads who wish you had posters here but could not because you had limited ability to complete projects during the past year. But there is a whole year now to catch up on that and then next year come back with, uh, with, with your posters. And um, at the same time, uh, in the afternoon, you will also have uh, the alumni panel. Uh, make sure you ask them questions. They are our own, and they have uh, succeeded in placing themselves in good positions, in good in, in a wide variety of areas. So reach out to them every year. This uh, that panel is a very engaged uh, panel. So uh, they are your resource, and they are really your life and resource. All our Panthers. And you, they will always be Panthers, and so you should take make sure that you take advantage of that. And then this morning we have a fantastic uh, speaker with us, and uh, you will learn a lot about the optic science of things. And today it, it turns out that the posters also reflect that aspect. So this will be a very nice educational opportunity for you, but also you will have a chance to talk with Dr. Mary in the yeah. afternoon, and she'll be around the posters, but I'm sure if you have Zoom questions, and you want to find, if, if you really want to talk with her in person, so to speak, online, I'm sure we can find time to make sure that you can Zoom in and talk to her also. She comes to, a, a, I will let Dr. Godavarti do the introduction, so I'm not talking about her too much more, except that have a great day. All right, welcome all. And wherever you can. Morning, everyone. I know most of you are on Zoom. I'm seeing the number counts going up. Uh, hang on. Just watch the breakfast from there. Next time, like Dr. Jem said, you can catch us at lunch if you want to swing by. Uh, so today we have Dr. Mary McDougall. She's from Texas A&M University. I just was telling her in the car ride that uh, I graduated from Texas A&M and I got my PhD. In. So we had a little chat and I learned that it's completely changed. So I'm never gonna recognize the place for good, but I'm gonna miss the place I stayed because I heard it was torn down and they made an even better place for graduate student housing. So leaving that aside, <laughs> Dr. McDougall, she's an associate professor in biomedical engineering department at Texas A&M University. And she also has a joint appointment with uh, uh, electrical and computer engineering. And uh, she is slash was the director of the undergraduate program at uh, uh, Texas A&M for biomedical engineering until August 31st. She, I heard she just stepped down and had the next person, her successor, take over the position. So she understands and appreciates a lot of the undergraduate stuff that goes on. Mm -hmm. Uh, she received her bachelor's from Texas A&M, so she's an Aggie, a fellow Aggie, but a lot more than me, I guess, <laughs> as an undergraduate, and uh, in electrical engineering, and her master's from John Hopkins, and once again, PhD from Texas A&M University, I believe we must have crossed paths sometime when we both got our degrees at the same university for our PhD, and all of that has been in electrical engineering degree. 
She directs the NMR RF lab. So her expertise is in uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging mm -hmm. and magnetic uh, resonance spectroscopy. And her research is focused on developing new hardware and methodologies for MR imaging and spectroscopy. She serves on the editorial board for magnetic resonance in medicine and as a standing member of the NIH Imaging Technology Development Study Section. So today she'll be talking about engineering approaches to increase the accessibility of magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy. With that, thank you so much. She's our first in-person speaker after the pandemic ended and we're back on. So thank you for making the visit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. That was a very nice introduction. I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Tech support is going to be our friend here. Um, for those of you that are in person, really appreciate it. It's super helpful to see faces. I know that you guys understand that, especially for anyone that does any teaching. And where's the camera? There. Hi, people on the room. Um, Thank you for being here too, and I'll try to talk to you as well. And feel free to use the chat to ask questions, and you can keep an eye on the chat for me. Yeah, at the end, I will go to the chat and bring the questions to you. Absolutely perfect. Um, so it was a great pleasure to be here, and I'm missing a, a pointer, so I'm just gonna use my finger. It's great to be here for your undergraduate research day. Um, I know that everyone is very proud of you and your department, and especially during this time where you've had to persevere through some unusual circumstances, to say the least. I am going to give you a little bit of an overview of Texas A&M, and um, really this is just for the shock value for Dr. Um, and then and then we'll move on to talking about magnetic resonance imaging and accessibility, the concept of accessibility and what we're looking for. Uh, we're over, you know, I, I don't think you care a lot about necessarily the College of Engineering stats and everything, but College Station, Texas is midway between Dallas, which is north, Houston is south, and Austin, which is, you know, every small well, it's west. So uh, we like to say when we're recruiting people, which obviously there's going to be a lot of that involved here, um, we like to say that we are not in the middle of nowhere, we're in the middle of everywhere. So when we're interviewing faculty members, we're encouraged to say <laughs> that we are not in the, the town that is completely all about Texas A&M, but we're in the middle of Houston, Dallas, and Austin, all these opportunities to work with different medical centers. This is why I said you wouldn't recognize where you used to go to school. This is the new Zachary Engineering Center. <laughs> it is. It was taken down to its pillars, but it was, so it, that's why I was able to retain the same name. And it's now housing um, 525,000 square feet that's dedicated to undergraduate lab education. So it's all experiential learning. The, the lab spaces look like this, um, and it's all, well, obviously that's pre-pandemic. Everyone's working at the same bench tops with their masks. But they're shared, it's shared laboratory spaces, and it's between departments, and uh, meaning that sometimes my medical engineering will be using this equipment, and sometimes electrical engineering students will be using this equipment, but it's all, it's all interdisciplinary. So as far as biomedical engineering specifically, this is a slide that I am pretty much directed to tell if you ever give an external speech, so I'm not going to dive much into this, but there are two things I want to point out here. This is the Emerging Technologies Building, which is where the parking lot is that you used to park in, um, and this is where biomedical engineering is housed. It's a relatively new building, less than 10 years, I guess, and then the lab, you know, where we do a lot of our work is up here. This is the research wing here, and uh, our lab's up here on the third floor. <clears throat> I'll be talking about some of the stuff we do. Second reason I wanted to point this out is that this is a particularly, it's, a, it's kind of a new area for our engineering school, but we, have, we hire what we call APT faculty. So that's academic and professional track faculty. So those are professors of practice for the professional track, professors of instruction for the, for the uh, POI. POI is the academic track. And that's really, that's really people who are focused on the education aspect of engineering. So this would be, these are the professors of practice kind of head up our design sequence. They, you don't need a PhD for this position. And the professors of instruction, I put a, a star by that one, we, we are actively hiring professors of instruction. So I don't know if anyone watching this is a graduate student who is interested in education, but if you are, then please consider um, applying to be a professor of instruction. And that is a PhD needed. 
these these are as a general research overview. We're kind of overhauling the way this looks right now. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that you're probably familiar, some of you, because of your strength in optical here in, mm -hmm. in, um, in optical research, then I think that you're probably familiar with some of the imaging technologies research that we do. But again, get just get a bird's eye view of the department because we'd really like you to consider us. You're obviously active researchers. We'd like you to consider us for graduate school. I already told y'all I was going to be actively coaching. Um, I told Dr. Hutchison and Dr. Odebarty. Uh, so just, I'm just going to look at the imaging technologies for a second because I think you might know some of these veins from the optical area. So just keep in mind what we look like from that, from that standpoint. I do want to talk about programmatic grants and again um, for well, three reasons actually. The first one that we have is the Southwest Pediatric Device Consortium, which is an FDA funded uh, award which focuses on the translation of pediatric devices. So it's TAMA led, Texas A&M University led, and then it's in you know collaborations with others. Paths Up is what I really want to focus on. And so this was, I'm going to read what Paths Up stands for just because <laughs> I don't know who came up with it. but. Precise advanced technologies and health systems for underserved populations. So that's paths up, and that, but that's the first reason I wanted to talk about that programmatic grant, that ERC, because it really is going to lead us into our accessibility theme for the day. And then the second reason I wanted to talk with it is because if you look at this with the partners from Rice, UCLA, UCLA and FIU, you have your own Dr. Romella Roman. Did I say her name correctly? And then uh, apparently. I just found out Dr. Hutchinson is also involved with, with the ERC, so I apologize for that oversight. But this is their, their vision, is to change the paradigm for the health of underserved populations. And so this is my first shameless plug. There will be four. I'm giving you a heads up. Shameless plug number one. You're about to get three of them out of the way. Um, the Pals Up program, the ERC itself, has its own independent undergraduate research program for the summer. So keep that in mind as you explore your future possibilities. The College of Engineering also has an undergraduate summer research program. We love it when you guys come and take part in that program. Um, here's sort of the this is research experience after your first, second, or third year. And this is the basics of it. You get housing, a $5,000 scholarship. You get to live in the great city of College Station, Texas. Um, and if you are beyond the third year, like headed into the graduation phase, and you still are not completely turned off by research, then this is my shameless plug number three. Apply to graduate school with us. <laughs> um, here's the information on applying on our webpage. It's pretty, it's pretty clear we would love to have you come and visit if you're unsure whether or not you would like the location or the people or anything like that. I think if you visit our website, you'll be able to find out uh, whether or not you're compatible with any of the faculty members or the lab before it's done. But these are the basics. If you want to be considered for full funding, then you're going to want to, that means like if you want to get a merit scholarship or diversity scholarship or the departmental fellowship, one of these, then you're going to want to apply by December 1st and you work with the nomination packages and have those all in by January. And then general admission though, if you just decide, oh crap, haven't got a job, don't know what I'm going to do, may as well apply to graduate school, you need to do that by May 1st. And so that would be, and then March 1st for international students. Okay, that was shameless plug number three. Let's move on to what we're going to talk about today, accessibility. The idea of accessibility, the definition of accessibility, clearly Google takes care of everything that you ever need to know about anything, but let's apply this to what we are actually doing here. The idea of being able to be reached, idea of availability, nearness, that, that concept for accessibility. What do we think of when we think about that with medicine? We think. Let's serve underserved populations. Let's bring imaging to the bedside. Let's make imaging a point of care opportunity. Let's make it portable. Let's make it low cost. Let's take our imaging, whatever we're doing, CT, ultrasound, MRI, let's take it to the bedside. Let's take it into the surgical suite. Let's take it into the NICU. Like, let's not move this little baby that's in such horrible health already. That's a, a danger to them. Go to this concept of easy to use or easily understood. That's also accessible, right? We need accessibility. We're collecting all of this data. We need it to be easily understood, and we need it to be, you know, intuitive user interfaces so that we have push button imaging. We need all of this is accessibility. And we want um, built-in image processing and analysis, especially as we start to talk about more complex 
sorts of data that we're collecting. Um, so accessibility is not uh, to imaging is not a new concept, right? This is new. This is old to new. So this is Madame Curie or Marie Curie in one of her mobile X-ray units. That's 1915. X-ray was invented, you know, in early late 1800s. We thought it very very soon. Um, it was immediately. We need to make this a portable technology, a movable technology, a mobile technology. Um, and also, this is a really cool website if you ever want to just get some cool images. Uh, but I mean, you take that from 1915 to, okay, look where we are, Amazon web space, medical imaging being more accessible, big data, coronavirus. This is from beginning of time to the end of time. <laughs> where it, spans, it spans the ages. What does it look like with respect to imaging currently? Well, I think we can all agree, I'm just going to start down here, that ultrasound has got this thing in the bag, the idea of accessibility, right? You got these things on medical airplanes with the military. This is, I mean, handheld. It doesn't get any more portable and accessible than this. You could they look at the price tags on these guys. It does not get any more accessible. Ultrasound uh, has really kind of paved the way for what the vision for accessibility should look like with respect to being able to access the equipment, the capabilities. Um, but we also talk about you've got mobile medical services, digital x-ray and EKG that they're offering. We've got, I put, this is a, uh, this is a graphic from the, from the Paths Up website. I just wanted you guys to see that their version of accessibility is really, it's wearable sensors. It's, uh, so I, that's why sensing is included up there. This is a, a, a portable CT scanner and it goes to the patient for head scans. I mean, these are patients, trauma patients that you don't want to be moving into an imaging suite and, and causing them any additional damage other than what they already experienced. So we've got portable CT scanners, portable um, X-ray scanners, they call it a radiographic unit. I went ahead and included um, the MRI scanner, which is FDA approved now. But if you really want to talk about what accessible means for MRI, you look to what was traditionally, you know, all the, the innovation used to happen in big corporate research labs, right? And now it is happening more in academia, which is fantastic. But you go straight to the Siemens website today on MRI, and this is what they're talking about. We're making MRI more accessible. And what do they mean by this? They're talking about body types and ages. So they're talking about the bore size of the scanner. They're talking about making it easier and less expensive to cite these magnets because that's a huge part of what makes it inaccessible. Um, increasing the value and increasing the operation here. We're talking about our user interface. So if you're talking about making MRI accessible, you know, we, we go back once again to the corporate definition of what that matters, of what that does. Um, we, I, for the purposes of this talk, I want to talk about accessibility for MRI into two different uh, categories, if you will. So accessibility of physical equipment, which is, I think, the very intuitive way of thinking about accessibility. We want to be smaller, cheaper, easier to get to. So that's access to the physical equipment. But I also think we need access to the all of the complex capabilities of MRI. So you look at ultrasound and you really can't do anything to affect contrast beyond what the actual um, reflectivity of your tissue interfaces are, right? Or if you look at x-ray and CT, you can't do anything other than look at the linear attenuation coefficients of the different tissues in your body as you put x-rays through your body. MRI is so much more complex. Magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy, you can control the contrast mechanisms in such a huge variety of ways that's a, that, that can be a turnoff, right, with respect to usability, but it's also where the power of MRI um, is. And so we want access to all those complex capabilities, and how do you do that? Well, we'll we're going to do that by making um, approachable user interfaces and approachable analysis tools so that it, so it's not so intimidating. And so the first thing I want to establish is the difference between mobile and portable. You guys have probably seen mobile MRI units. That's mobile. That's not. It's not portable because portable is defined with respect to imaging as it can be pushed. Go back to um, look at these images. It can be pushed by a single healthcare provider. It can be taken to the room. It um, can operate on standard 
office or medical space, like you can plug it into the wall. You go look at the MR unit here. It's just plugged right into a standard wall outlet. So we have respect to power and cooling, all of this. There can't be any special siting considerations. So that's where we're going to define portable versus mobile, because this is a standard MR scanner. It's got special power requirements. It's got all of the same. That's not a it's not a, a unit that a, a person could push along. I mean, imagine a person trying to push that truck. So not going to happen. This is a portable MRI. And I had to show this because this is um, Hyperfine, which is the FDA cleared portable MR unit now, the only one. And this is my former graduate student, um, Samantha Bai, who works for Hyperfine, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and I guess I wanted to I wanted to emphasize too that when we're sitting here talking about accessibility and portability, you're talking about changing the role of a modality. Because right now people use MRI um, to diagnose, um, and we're talking about instead using it for more broad, you know, broad applications, including monitoring um, of disease instead. Okay, you're engineers, right? Um, we are taught to bound problems. You're taught to bound problems. So what are the macro constraints here? So if you look at the cost of MRI, over a third of it is sitting here in the magnet and the cryostat. So today we're going to kind of talk about those two concepts of access, access to the equipment and access to the power of MRI. And we're going to talk about it in the context of magnetic field strength and how we as engineers can kind of bridge what might be two kind of fighting concepts with respect to field strength. All right, so here we are. This is how, if, if you were to come into Aggieland, you would hear this a lot. I've got a little story for you, Aggs. And then all of a sudden, this stadium just erupts with screaming Aggies. Um, so pretend those people are making a lot of noise. I've got a little story for you, Aggs. We have to work within these bounds to achieve our goals. So here's our here's our story of the day. Trade-offs are one way that can we can that can lead to innovation. We don't have to just invent something crazy and brand new. What we can do as engineers is manage these trade-offs um, in, in our design consideration. And so our goal is just to be creative about what you can sacrifice and how you can compensate for that sacrifice. And when we're talking about magnetic field strength and MRI, that's exactly where we are. So you've got low fields, standard clinical fields, high fields, and then you've got, I'm not going to say advantages and disadvantages. We are going to use the phrases benefits and challenges. So we have the benefits of the lower cost with the accessibility with respect to low field, lower cost, a proven potential for portability. But you come down here, you're going to have less sensitivity, less um, homogeneity of your field. So you have less access to the potential of MRI, but you have more access to the equipment. And then you get sort of the same issues here in clinical. You know, this isn't something that you'd be able to push around on a cart, a clinical MRI, 1.5T, 3T. Um, but uh, you have a little bit more accessibility to the usability factor because this is what you walk in the, wherever, if you, any of you have had an MRI, you walk in, the tech isn't entering every single parameter. The tech is pushing a button that says what type of scan that you're supposed to get. So that makes, that increases the accessibility of standard clinical. You move to high field. High field gives us access to immense amounts of information in, in the human body that we can't see at standard clinical field strengths or at low fields. But it's expensive, it's complicated, and it's extremely complex with respect to the usability factor. So let's let's talk about magnets and magnetic field strength a little bit more. Um, as a very general rule, so you've got lots of different types of magnets here, but as a very general rule for whole body scanners, you're looking at about a million dollars per Tesla. So you're thinking, okay, well, if I'm looking to control cost, let's stay with low field. Great. We're just, same thing, look at the different types of magnets. You've got permanent magnets, which go up to between 0.06 and 0.35T Tesla. You've got resistive magnets, um, which was actually the very first MR scanner that you ever, uh, it was ever used. It's a resistive uh, scanner, and it was actually in Irene, Scotland. So that's with electric current running through the windings of the coil. And then superconducting, which is what's in every clinic now, superconducting magnets is what we're using for MRI. And that means zero resistance to the flow of electrical current, the definition of superconducting. And you use niobium titanium wire, and you keep the wires very cold using liquid helium and nitrogen. 
And this gives us our clinical field strengths of, you know, up to 50,000 times or so the Earth's fields. So we'll look at 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla that are our clinical field strengths. So you see these scanners and they're operating usually in that range. Whole body scanners, now FDA approved, go all the way up to 7 Tesla. There's a reason we aren't seeing these in hospitals. Um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then, you, of course, you have this 10 and a half Tesla up in Minnesota, uh, which is a research scanner. All types of scanners are offered on a commercial market. So anytime you see a P here, that's a permanent scanner. So we've got a neonatal one Tesla permanent scanner. Um, you've got Fonar that's got even resistive scanners, which is pretty uncommon. Um, and then everything else that you see labeled that doesn't have a mark, that's all superconducting standard. You go to Siemens, these are all superconducting magnets. They've got their Terra that's at 7T, their Magneton, the Vario is not listed here, but those are, that takes us down, it uh, takes us to three Tesla. And then you come down here and they've even got a permanent and a resistive magnet as well. Lots of commercial options. And then when you're talking about the power of using permanent magnets, move into the research arena, and you've got stuff like this, got Andrew Webb over in Leiden, um, who, if you take a look at this, we're truly starting to talk about portable MRI. We're talking about a version of it that is this. It's thousands of permanent magnets that are, uh, they use an algorithm to, to optimize the location and angle of those permanent magnets in order to get as homogeneous a field as possible within here to use that for portable MRI. So it's currently being used in Uganda uh, for children with hydrocephalus, and then the grant that he just got will allow them to do affordable applications for other, uh, affordable MRI for other applications, and then of course open source. So this is the definition of accessible MRI, right? Keep looking um, up in Massachusetts. There are uh, lots of great work being done by Larry Wald, Clarissa Cooley, uh, Zimmerman, and Jason Stockman. And this is a couple of pictures of their work. But again, these are portable, uh, very portable. You can see this monk up here. Uh, uh, solutions that are made with multiple permanent magnets that are algorithmically arranged for uh, homogeneity. And then because I don't want to just talk about cool things other people are doing, because I want you to think Texas A&M is really cool too. Uh, this is shameless plug, final plug number four. And that is if you come to Texas A&M, you can take this really cool course that I helped develop. It's an MRI engineering lab, and you get to build your own desktop MRI scanner. So we are going to give you um, your little desktop magnet, and that's it. And then the rest of it's up to you to build from scratch your whole spectrometer. I mean, we'll give you the lab view and equipment like this, but you're going to build your own RF coils, your own gradient coils. You're going to code all of your own, um, all of your own pulse sequences, and it's obviously the coolest class in the whole world. So you'll want to come take that. Um, once we talk about, we've talked about how great, right, all of, all of low field accessible scanners are, but why, why don't we just operate everything down there? Let's just do that. Well, we don't have, it doesn't provide us the access to the information that MRI could potentially offer. And look, for that, I've got to give you just about this much MRI physics, not too much at all. Our protons have small positive charge and they spin. So nuclei are normally randomly oriented, but any nucleus that has an odd number of protons has a net spin to it. So it's a, a net magnet moment that can be controlled. We call those NMR active nuclei. Very, very fortunately, hydrogen has one proton, right? So it has a net spin. We like that because there's a lot of water in our bodies and fat. So let's talk about water because we're positive. But that's, that's a lot of uh, potential to talk to those nuclei, right? And that's going to be the source of our, of our signal from our eye. And I, I mean, all of, I'm going to take a sidebar here, because I feel like all of medical imaging is so, we just operate on the super blessed front, right? Because it's about energy in, energy out, and we're just so fortunate that our bodies interact with the right kind of energy or we see what's on the inside of them. I mean, the concept of seeing inside a human body without cutting it open is, is reasonably new in human history. In fact, in human history, it's like a paper-thin slice of the hollowed x-ray. So very fortunately, we can put x-rays into our body 
and our tissues have enough different linear attenuation coefficients that we actually get contrast from what's inside. We get the X-rays out on the other side. And if you put, you know, ultrasound sound energy into your body, fortunately, our tissues have just enough difference in the reflectivities between them that you can see the boundaries. And you get that difference on the other side. If there was less reflectivity or if there was more, then you would just hit the first boundary and get reflected back and not see anything else. And then with MRI, we're just so fortunate that right here, falling in the radio frequency range, we can talk to hydrogen. And so what happens when you put those spinning protons into a very strong magnetic field? So this is our magnetic field strength here. We put a person into this big, strong magnet or you put the head in the, into a magnetic field, what happens is those protons align with or against the magnetic field and a very slight excess aligns with the main magnetic field. And when I say slight, I really mean it. So this is just an example. There's five that are aligned with B naught, our main magnetic field, and there's four that are aligned against. So we have one spinning proton that is the source of our signal. So take that up to a bigger scale. I keep forgetting I have this thing. So this is a distribution of 2 million protons, for instance, and here's our main magnetic field strength. So out of 2 million protons at 0.5 Tesla, out of 2 million, three in, are in excess aligned with the main magnetic field. Move up to 1.5 Tesla, which is a clinical field strength. You've got nine out of 2 million that are aligned at, um, with the field. And that's the source of our signal is this delta. How much is aligned with instead of against? And so this is the main message where we say, well, we can't just use low field accessible scanners, roll them around and do, why not? Well, because more field means you have more excess spins, which means you have more signal. And we need that signal to really harness the power of MRI and be able to observe what it can do. So I, this is another apologies for the equation. I know this is supposed to be a fun thing for y'all. But, um, but you need to understand from an, from an engineering standpoint, this is what you're battling. You know, if you want to bring a portable MRI to a small town in South Africa, this is, this is the engineering challenge to you, is that we have in our signal equation, which is good and noise is bad, signal ends up being proportional to your magnetic field strength squared, and your noise ends up being proportional to your magnetic field strength. So altogether, your signal to noise ratio is directly proportional to your magnetic field strength that you're using. And this has been, it's been, it's really where the MR community thought that everything was going. We had 1.5 Tesla research for clinical scanners in every hospital ever, right? And then we moved up to three Tesla clinical scanners, and it was the, the, the transition was beautiful and exquisite. And we thought, well, let's just go up to seven Tesla. Why not? Well, we're going to talk about that. Um, talk about the advantages and disadvantages. But when you talk about what you can get from this extra signal to noise, let's talk about it. It's actually significant. Let's say you take your voxel, your resolution, and you want a millimeter resolution, a millimeter by millimeter by millimeter resolution and you want to take it to 10 micron resolution. So if you keep your, if you say, okay, I'm keeping, um, I'm keeping the imaging time the same. I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to go from a millimeter resolution to 10 micron resolution. You're going to lose a factor of two, three, six in your, in your signal to noise ratio. You're not going to be able to see anything. Okay. What if we say, okay, well, we're going to keep us and our constant signal to noise ratio constant. How much time would it take then? So if you look up in your imaging, in your SNR equation, we're going to take that voxel size from one millimeter down to 10 micron. We want to keep our imaging, um, we want to keep our SNR the same. Then you look at it, it takes you 1.9 million years in order to keep your SNR the same. If you wanted to see the same amount at one millimeter to 10 micron. So it is a big deal to gain that SNR that you gain with field strength. It's not just the, uh, it's not just a, a story. What does it actually look like to gain that kind of SNR? It looks beautiful. You can look at the difference here between this is, I think this is 3T and 7T. Uh, yes. Look at this spectacular 7 Tesla image taken at Vanderbilt. You got 7T and 3T here. You also gain access to completely new capabilities. Susceptibility weighted imaging, you can do this at clinical field strengths, but if you get up to seven Tesla, susceptibility weighted imaging is beautiful. And you can look at those lesions that are, um, that are visible 
with the susceptibility weighted imaging in the brain. And as you can see, immense amounts of power in MRI that you really need field strength to access. This is some work that we did with UT Southwestern where we're using um, susceptibility weighted imaging to really see small microcalcifications. Another really cool part about having greater susceptibility artifacts, good and bad, at 7T is your bold contrast, your blood oxygenation level dependence. That means you can get really spectacular functional images at 7 Tesla, where you're activating parts of the brain and you're able to see the difference um, in activated versus unactivated states. And you can tell what parts of the brain are being used for what activity. Okay, I am gonna take another sidebar here um, before I talk about the coolest gift from higher field strength, because in my opinion, the coolest gift is accessing nuclei other than hydrogen. Imaging is really great, but you know what? Three Tesla does it beautifully. So we, we, the coolest thing about gaining, about moving up to higher field strengths is the fact that you can talk to other nuclei. Talk to carbon-13, and you can talk to sodium, and you can talk to uh, other metabolisms and metabolic activities in the body that you can't necessarily do at lower field strengths. In that SNR equation, you might remember it was proportional to gamma v naught. And that gamma there that you had was a Larmor coefficient that gets lower and lower and lower with other nuclei. Hydrogen's the highest gamma that you look at. So we lose that sensitivity as you want to look at other nuclei, and therefore it is really cool to move the higher field strengths, get this extra sensitivity boost. And that's <laughs> we're talking to nu nuclei. So it is nuclear, this phenomenon is nuclear magnetic resonance that we're talking about. Nuclear. And yet it's not in the name, but it used to be. So this is my sidebar because it's kind of fun. And also I totally get to name drop. It's well, you don't know anything about the MR world, but Mark Griswold, who's a really big deal in the MR world, had a weird memory and I asked him, you know, I thought I remembered you saying that if you speak nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, what happened to nuclear? And he said um, that the head of the society, or this is a long time ago, 80, 84, head of the Society of Nuclear Medicine gave a keynote at their annual meeting talking about how great this new NMRI will be to have in the, NMR, uh, the nuclear medicine department. And radiology said, uh-uh, nah, -uh. you're going to be with radiology. So there was, a strong, there was a strong indication that this was a turf war between, and maybe this is a conspiracy theory, turf war between nuclear medicine and radiology. So I did, I pinged Paul Bottomley, name drop. Um, and he said, I had to redact some of this because he wasn't very complimentary about GE. But, um, but yes, he said he believed that the word nuclear was dropped from NMR imaging to keep the technology and radiology in a way from nuclear medicine departments. The way that it was couched in, by radiology was that the public was going to be too scared of the word nuclear and wouldn't understand it. And Paul Bottomley and Bill Edelstein wrote um, very strongly worded, these are from 19, again, 1984. These are the originals that he emailed me, which are great. Letters to the editor saying people are smarter than that. They understand that nuclear is not necessarily bad. This, the term nuclear magnetic resonance was coined by the Nobel laureate. <laughs> Let's keep perspective here. And uh, it didn't matter. It was all for naught. So the point is we can look at other nuclei at higher fields other than hydrogen. We don't just have to image. And that's cool. That leads to this concept of an in vivo biopsy, multinuclear biomarkers, right? Um, metabolic sensing, this is really the, the key to, to metabolics and with using MRI. And, it, and so we're sitting over here and we say, oh, okay, great, low fields are great, they're portable, they can do whatever, um, they can give us images and we can, they're very accessible. And then we come over here to high field and we say, oh, no, high field's great, we can look at, get all this other information and have access to disease, and it's true. It's it's all true, we, but it's this spectrum that sort of fights itself a little bit. And so this is straight off the Phillips website. Um, you can deepen your insight into disease. The, so the extra detail can be particularly helpful for diagnostic procedures, um, enhancing lesion character, uh, characterization, looking at metabolic processes. And then right down here at the bottom, you get this little asterisk. The system is marked for research applications only, it's not for clinical use. Okay, why? <laughs> a lot of reasons. <laughs> We're going to talk about just one. Um, I'll check my time. I don't want this. We're doing fine. Um, yes, increased scanner weight. You guys can see the stats there. Fringe fields, different contrast kinetics. 
lots of different issues with respect to cryogen consumption, um, projectile issues, maybe your magnetic, uh, your devices, you know, your uh, internal devices that don't do the same. This is what we're going to really talk about. That's the biggest. This has been the biggest hindrance to Seven Tesla moving into the clinic, and that's our RF uh, field inhomogeneity. And with that comes this increased deposition of energy into the body. So this is where we move into electromagnetics. You look up there, this is where I would love to have a laser pointer, but the frequency that you use are these protons that are in this magnetic field. We need to talk to them, right? We need antennas to talk to them. They're basically near-field antennas. We call them RF coils. If you've ever had an MRI, right, you probably have one put on you because you had a knee or something, but this is, this is the device that's talking to your body and it operates at radio frequency uh, wavelengths. And so MRI operates down here and you've got your wavelength listed here. We move up and we've got others. You guys are familiar with this range of the electromagnetic spectrum with respect to imaging. And then of course you move up into ionizing radiation up here. Um, this, is, this is wavelength in air. And that frequency in air and its wavelength is significantly different than the frequency that same frequency when you put it into our conductive human body because that wavelength tightens up. And it's, okay, same frequency, 200 megahertz out here, you put that 200 megahertz frequency in the human body, it's conducting, same frequency, different wavelength. So you look at the issue that we have here as we move up in field strength. This is, you know, 64 megahertz, 58 centimeter wavelength in the human body, you know, something like this. So you're only gonna be capturing that wavelength across the human body is relatively constant. And we're, we're even okay at three Tesla, although you start to see a little bit. Move up to seven Tesla and that, that wavelength is at 12 and a half centimeters in the human body. So this has been the biggest problem. And actually, if you want me to be honest, I'm a little shocked that nobody thought of this before they started developing seven Tesla scanners. Didn't we think to maybe model this? But you look at the difference in images at three Tesla, four Tesla, five Tesla, move up to seven Tesla and look at this. You're getting significant constructive and destructive wave interference when you move up to these higher field strengths. And this has been the biggest hurdle for, for high field imaging. Yeah, you could do all these exquisite things. You have access to all this cool chemical information, but it's very difficult to get RF into the body at the frequency that you have to, to talk to those protons. You look at what it looks like for whole body imaging, it's even more, uh, I think it's more, pronounced and you just have entire areas of the body that are dark and then you have entire areas of the body that are bright with the construct of interference and what's worse it's in the middle of the brain where all of our dissipative blood flow that's meant to dissipate heat from our body is all on the outer parts of our body right this is not where our body is is built to dissipate heat so we have we have um a pretty big problem at the, and what's worse is the solutions are super complex so lots and lots of research is being done in this area with multiple transmitters around the body and phasing them correctly to get um, amplitude and phase to get homogeneous they call it b1 shimming so that you're creating the most homogeneous but imagine how complex that is with respect to getting field maps our field maps getting them back out optimizing their amplitude and phase for homogeneity or for, you know, for targeted fo field focusing. Very, very complex solutions. Okay, so that brings us to, back to accessibility and our whole point here. Because I realized as I was putting together this presentation, I feel like I'm down in the kitchen cooking and my kids are up in the playroom shouting at each other. Um, yeah, we want access to the physical equipment. We also want access to the complex capabilities. So it's like, I'm low cost, I'm horrible and cool, you're expensive and huge, and you're inaccessible. No, you're inaccessible. I can actually have access to everything more I can do. I can do things that your stupid low field can never do. And then it's like, okay, keep calm and engineer on. And then I thought, well, they're gonna think I'm really cool for even knowing about something like this. And so they're probably gonna wanna wear that t-shirt. I'm gonna crack a joke. They're gonna wanna wear that t-shirt out to whatever bar tonight. And then it occurred to me, I don't know y'all's bars and you know you nerds probably wouldn't even want that t-shirt anyways but Yelp told me that these are some good ones I should visit any of them question mark no <laughs> which one's the worst question <laughs> none of them okay never mind you can tell me later 
So here's our <clears throat> here's our plat to our, our our big message slide: the benefits and the challenges, and what we are going to do to help bridge this gap, shall we say? So this is this is your job as engineers, right? When you take these challenges and say, well, we need to give we need to give these advantages. We need to be able to somehow try to translate them to lower fields and the lower fields we need to be able to translate and the usability we need to translate to the higher fields. And so I'm just going to give you a very few personal examples that we've worked on and then we'll, we'll close things up. So for instance, I said, well, we, we can look at these other nuclei other than hydrogen at higher fields, it's much more difficult at lower fields. All right, so we, we did a project for looking at 31 um, phosphorus spectroscopy at one Tesla to look at the intermuscular fat and uh, metabolites during exercise. So you remember that, go back to that SNR equation, what was up there on top, there was a B1, that's the RF field that you're using. So let's use more than one RF channel so that we get more signal. Well, what do we need? We need to be able to have multiple channels that can receive um, multiple frequencies because we want to look at phosphorus and at hydrogen. So we need a broadband system four channels of signal reception. We need a multi-channel coil. So we've built the coil, built the broadband scanner. We've got a four-channel array, which means we have more sensitivity, built the transmit coil. And, and then you look at, and it, 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 it worked. I mean, we got, so we had a, the single large element is the comparison point for, and, uh, for the array. And then you looked at the four element array and our SNR went up from 18 to 33 and our line width went down, which is good. That means your more homogeneous magnet. Your line width goes down. Um, this was actually taken from my very, very crampy, tired calf after six minutes of flex, uh, foot flexion with pretty decent temporal resolution. So you can tell when the exercise started and when the exercise ended and recovery began. And this is exactly what we're looking at. And the, the target was for COPD patients in order to characterize their muscular capabilities. Um, uh, if you look at a clinical field strength, so that was low field, look at a clinical field strength. What you have a lot of times is this, you have a lack of these, as I said, broadband uh, receivers that can look at different nuclei. So we wanted to look at 16 channel uh, carbon 13 breast spectroscopy and their 16 channel receiver only received hydrogen because it's accustomed to being used for imaging only. And so the solution for that engineering solution, right? Great. Transmit on hydrogen. We're going to mix it down to carbon 13 and then combine it, transmit on the receiver array side. We've got our 16 channel receiver array. We're going to mix that up to hydrogen and we're going to fool the system into thinking that it's receiving hydrogen instead of carbon. And so that was our, that was our frequency translation unit is what we called it, but we were able to increase our SNR and Oh, these are results. We don't have to look at results. Uh, let's move up to high field and look at an example. You guys remember that the inhomogeneous high field images I was showing. Well, this is a low cost solution for um, for being able to, I'm not going to call it shimming necessarily, although it's written right there, so I'm completely contradicting myself. But what we did was we steered the field um, using a very, very simple, cheap, flexible phase shifter. And this is the array coil that we were using to transmit. And it was, as I said, it was more a field steering in the body. So you get all of the advantage of the signal and you just steer it to where you want it, where you want to focus um, your energy, no pun intended, all pun intended. Okay, what if you're not a hardware person? What if you're a software person? You can increase accessibility with software, right? We're talking about getting all this spectroscopy data. No one knows how to read that. No, no one knows what that means. Oh, that peak is higher than that peak. Oh, we're definitely cancer. I mean, it's, so we need we needed something that is uh, increase the accessibility to the analytics of spectroscopy. And have a student working on um, all of that and the SNR capabilities. This gives you the. I I'll go ahead. Do I have time to play that video? Not really. It's, okay, this, this is from Cloudy with Chance of Meatballs. Remember when he says it's the da -da 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 -da, it's the da -da -da, and he says the acronym and it's really funny. So this is the multi-channel NMR spectroscopy GUI. The, my graduate students thought that was really funny. 
they made that slide on me. <laughs> okay, y'all aren't laughing, so. <laughs> oh, there's no snow. Oh, for short. The I'm continuing on the theme of using software instead of hardware. For our, look up here, we're talking about artificial intelligence for medical imaging accessibility. Magnetic resonance fingerprinting is a very, very hot topic. This is uh, most of this work's being done at Case Western up there with Mark Griswold. And it's a, essentially a, a three part process where you pseudo randomly acquire data from the body, varying different parameters. You run it through a dictionary and you qualitatively, quantitatively, um, talk about the characteristics of each tissue. Okay, so here we are. We talked about engineering solutions. We're talking about trade-offs between all these advantages and disadvantages with respect to accessibility. So we were able to handle low field, the less sensitivity and homogeneity and lack of friendliness to non-1H nuclei by using multiple channels, RF channels. We can add this frequency translation unit to increase accessibility to non-1H, to things more than imaging. We can take care of complications and complexity with respect to usability with software, with other pulse sequence techniques. <clears throat> and so that brings us to where we are. Um, I was going <laughs> to... So much of this seems so much funnier what's in your head. Um, <laughs> I was going to sing you Joni Mitchell, you know, both sides now that song. There's something's lost, but something's gained. I'm not going to sing. Um, but that's where, that's where I'm talking about. You're operating at this interface where we have these trade-offs, and this is where your problem solving comes in, and you're training yourself as researchers or problem solvers, and you need to be really, really proud of yourself. You hear that, people on Zoom? You need to be proud of yourself. Are you paying attention? Um, so congratulations, and good for you. And I think this is a really big, fun day for you all. And... Um, I know that Dr. Godavarti is very proud of you as well. Um, you, you, um, and this, this goes for, I think this goes for us as faculty as well, whether we think we're supposed to do something or we are doing it, but not as well as we want or whatever. At the end of the day, you are fulfilling your mission, your vocation by just wanting to better the human condition. And I think you need to keep that in mind and sleep well at night. And that's it. Thank you for having me. story and to kind of say we do have a course in medical imaging and I think there are students probably on the zoom watching because MRI is one big segment that they actually see and learn so Good. this would be amazing so I'll stop here I'll ask if anybody here has questions before we go to the zoom chat link questions just I don't know a lot about MRI so when you're gonna use <laughs> use different uh, nuclei instead of hydrogen? You can't image that. That's just for the spectro spectroscopy data? It's a fantastic question, actually. Um, everything except for sodium, you image can image sodium. Oh. Yeah, because you have to have enough signal in order to be able to make an image. Yeah, and the sodium you can actually image in the body. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Those on Zoom, if you have any questions, if you want to type it out there, that would be helpful. Otherwise, you get eight minutes of your life back. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So when you're trying to make these, the class that you said that's very exciting, and you're trying to make these little portable ones, the bench top magnets, one of the bigger things why MRI is kind of challenging to bring it down size is because you need to shield the magnetic yeah. field from outside. You may make the magnet smaller. The shielding is what could be challenging. So how do you do it for your class, and how do they do it for the field? I Okay, yeah. took the shield off to take that picture. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so the shield is just there is. We just literally, we built screen, uh, screened boxes and just, we clip them down physically. So yes, there's an RF shield around the magnet that was not in the photograph. Okay. 
because no one is supposed to know that. <laughs> so even when they are trying to do these small uh, portable MRIs that you show, which is on wheels, and you plug it in, do they have the shielding already uh, right built on top? Another awesome question. So part of their part of their portability is that they they have RF uh, like interference active active shielding um, off the room or something. Sometimes in the room, but you no, know, uh, as part of their processing. They have little wow. antennas around that actually detect noise and can't have active cancellation. It's really cool. It, like following up on that, isn't that even with the larger larger board uh, systems with the even up to like the seven P ones have got RF shield, the active, active shielding, shielding. Active yeah. shielding. Yeah. And in your list of um, and all, all all clinical scanners are actively shielded. shielded. Yeah, and it makes. But that a lot of the, that that they're talking about when they say active shielding is for the fringe fields, so that you don't have. Um, they're not necessarily talking about RF when they say actively shielded. They're just meaning that you can put it in a room that's this size, rather than having to have take care of fringe fields, so that no one with a pacemaker can come near it for you know five thousand feet or something. So when they say actively shielded, they're they're confining the um, that main magnetic field. I have a question about just the. All those, um, there was a slide you showed many companies with many different, mm -hmm. uh, uh, many different uh, systems. First, I didn't see Varian mm -hmm. in there, or did I miss it? No, it's, I think it, it was there. there. We have a Varian scanner. Right. I hope it was there. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I, I, I was looking and I thought I, I missed that. Uh, the, and these other companies, there are a lot of them that I see there. Are they in the US market? Are they specialized for certain MR capabilities? Or how, you know, and if, if students want to are thinking about joining one of these companies, you know, can you maybe tell a little bit more? Everybody knows GE, everybody knows Siemens, and they may or may not know about Varian, but uh, uh, and these other ones. Yeah, they'll be. I I think oh, I don't know a whole lot. Okay, I'm in electrical engineering, but the, the I I think a lot of those are going to be applications. <clears throat> application specific so especially when you get the permanent scanners you saw one of them was a neonatal scanner you're going to see like that scanner we have is an OMI scanner that's an extremity scanner only so it's only for feet and knees um, so a lot of them are going to be applications based Varian, Bruker, they, they target animals right the small animals in particular um, so I, I think the application specific for sure hyperfine which is the portable one targets heads uh, that, that's that's all I have to say about that. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I have one other quick question I was going to ask about the animal study. So you know how they have these small MR scanners for these animals that you can put the whole slice model or something? How is that portability? What is the main difference between that and taking yours for human subjects and trying to make it portable? Is it more the Tesla that's going down or is it because it's all about resolution, right? Because with those small, with the animals. You don't you, need that much Tesla. No, you no, you need more because more, more you need better resolution. Yeah, there. So a lot of the small animal scanners you're going to see are seven Tesla scanners. I mean, they're small four or seven Tesla scanners, but you get lots of signals so that you can get that exquisite resolution. You need to look at a mouse. Good question there. Um, so please, good question. Um, the scanner is used in like the MRI is used in um, hospitals. Do they require like the power that's on like normal wall? Or... Oh, no. <laughs> Way more. <laughs> yeah, and it's for the gradient amplifiers. It's not, I mean, when you have a superconducting scanner, yeah, it's got hundreds of amps flowing through it, making that big magnetic field, but that's, once you ramp it up, it's superconducting. Those hundreds of amps just sit there unless you have something really disastrous happen. So when you've got that main magnetic field, it's in place. That's why it's so funny when you're watching a show like House or Grey's Anatomy and they're, you know, like, oh, we, we didn't turn the scanner on yet. That scanner is always on. That is a superconducting <laughs> magnet that you don't turn that off unless someone is trapped in there behind an oxygen container or something. You know what I mean? It's, it would be an emergency to turn that thing off. You turn it off. You after, quench it. After so many seasons, they should have learned it. They should have. <laughs> no one asked me, though. <laughs> so you yeah. to the... But the power is for the gradients, which is it's, they, they're huge amplifiers that you need to get the localization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you thank you for your talk by the way, it was really informative. You mentioned constructive 
and the destructive interference in the higher Tesla uh, realities. Uh, you, you mentioned how that's like uh, not really uh, good for imaging purposes, but also you mentioned about heat dissipation. So at what point does that become like damaging to tissues into the human body? And uh, is that why you don't see them as much in, in clinical use, or is there a different other reasons why they might not be uh, beneficial for patients? These are such great questions. Um, there are so many slides I wanted to put in here, but I too much to tell you. Um, like yes, the heat dissipation. There are FDA guidelines for all of that for what you're able to star the heat to show up in the body in lots per kilogram per, per time. Um, and all of that's managed by by parameters that you input about every RF coil that you're using. There's parameters that are specifically input about that RF coil into the scanner, and the scanner doesn't allow you to go over certain time cycling, certain power levels that to keep you under the SAR limits for that particular breed of scanner, breed of RF coil. It's all very, yeah, so operating between, that's part of the challenge for us, at least within operating between the clinical world and the research world, is because sometimes you have to break those rules. One is about the, the bigger bigger systems have cryogen coolers. Yes. So maybe you could comment on that. And then going back to the animal studies, sometimes and maybe less now than it used to be, if you wanted to get a higher strength imaging, but you only had like a 1.5 Tesla, then you could implant a small coil. And then take advantage of that because that's still happening. Do people still do that? And so, okay, two fold answer. I'll talk about cryogens in just a second. Um, the, there are two things that you might be thinking of. One, people were using super low field permanent magnets and then they were putting pre-polarizers inside. Maybe is what you're so you, thinking about more they were actually in like animal studies where you wanted to say uh, uh, image the spark cord and they really were the seven tesla is not there or whatever or the capabilities are not there to go back there then there's like local coils being absolutely outside. okay so that's the rf coil the antenna part of it you're i mean think about the fact you guys if you're, if you're transmitting you're going to transmit signal into the whole body and you're going to receive signal from everything that you talk to. You're going to receive noise and you're going to receive signal. So the, when you tighten up that RF coil, you're getting you're receiving signal and noise only from the minimum region. So you get much better transmission and much higher V1, and then you get only the, the maximum amount of noise out, like that you, or the minimum amount of noise out for that field of view. So you target, especially if you're talking about doing that, if you're talking about animals in a lower field, you're going to have to have a targeted, a custom RF coil to talk to that little animal in order to maximize your SNR. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that higher Tesla, seven Tesla, getting high frequency coils feel into the body is a problem. So are there any other ways to get the field uh, to like some micro catheters or some minimally invasive ways to get that field locally near the uh, yeah, and you're exactly I mean, you're exactly right. That's where people are going with higher fields is doing more localized, more localized imaging. I think there's some work that's been done. Oh, well, there is some work done with whole body set of Tesla imaging. But at the end of the day, if you want to do whole body imaging, go down to your three Tesla scanner. If you want to get exquisite information from a more localized location, then yeah, let's you can do it with targeted RF coils. People are using meta materials. They're using things to kind of bend the RF field. And, and put it where they want it. Um, there's, it's a huge active area of research, and I, I can't even. There are entire sessions on it in the ISMRM. Oh, sorry, you have so many questions. What about good, <laughs> right? <laughs> what about you know? There's more and more implants in the neural world that are happening now. And uh, it's something like we ourselves have, have, have something where we are putting bars inside nerves. What do you see as the and FDA is asking for more MR compatibility, but it seems like the worlds are really still quite different. You know, the, you know, you can't just change a material to do a stem electrode. 
whereas those may or may not be capable of, or especially if you start to target and do localize the imaging, then it might, even if you have little material there, it might be terrible. So do you have any thoughts of what you might guide people to thinking about? Yeah, no, I don't have a whole lot, but MR safety is a whole area also. It's a whole um, subsection of MR studies is MR, MR safety, and, um, and it does have to do a lot mostly with the plants. But um, there, again, most of those, uh, addressing most of those issues moves to the pulse sequence side, to like how you're putting those gradient, those changes in the magnetic field in, how fast you're doing it, and what you can use if you put you know, a gradient in one direction, you can put it in another to compensate and take back the effect of the of the device. And that's a lot of where that compatibility comes in, is in controlling those sequences and characterizing them. I mean, I, I, lots and lots of modeling. Not my area. So computational work. Yeah, a lot of it. So, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. It was a great talk. Thank you all.